Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Don Boudreau, my colleague here at George Mason University, where he is the chairman of the economics department. And Don and I co-host the blog Cafe Hayek. And a reader of that blog, Joel Turner, asked us to comment on the potential virtues of buying local, this idea that it's better to buy from, say, your local hardware store rather than a national chain, and extending the logic better to buy from an American company rather than a foreign company. I thought it'd make a good podcast topic. Don, welcome back to Econ Talk. My pleasure. So what do you think of this idea? Uh, it seems there's a certain superficial appeal. It seems like a good idea. I think the argument of the defenders of the idea is that when we buy from, say, a Virginian, uh, the money stays in Virginia. When we buy from an American, the money at least stays in America. When we buy from a foreigner, the money goes overseas. So it's better to buy from an American than a foreigner. It's better to buy from a Virginian uh, than a Marylander. And presumably by that argument, it's better to buy from a Fairfaxian, somebody who's here in Fairfax, where we're located at George Mason, rather than someone from across the state in uh, Roanoke. Uh, any truth to those arguments? No, none at all. My my great teacher of international economics at NYU years ago, the late Fritz Mockler, once said that in class he said that the uh, all these protectionist arguments or these these buy local arguments uh, they reduce to if you take them seriously they reduce to the argument that uh, the left arm should not purchase from the right arm or should ex- not, should not exchange with the right arm and the right arm should not exchange with the left arm. Uh, the same logic that says that the Fairfaxian should only buy from Fairfax can be used to, well, the person at 5703 Oak Street should only uh, consume those things produced at 5703 Oak Street. Why, why let the demand for food and automobiles and, and, and eyeglasses and heating oil escape from 5703 Oak Street? Keep it right there and make everyone at 5703 Oak Street wealthy. Of course, that's just an argument for subsistence, and no subsistence society has ever been wealthy. It's, subsistence, it's a reason why subsistence societies are, well, subsistence is a synonym for very poor. Yeah, but self-sufficient societies. Self-sufficient, that's right. There's a reason why self-sufficient societies have always been subsistence societies. So I think that's one way to, I think, get at the fallacy that we're, we're talking about here is to, it's a reductio ad absurdum. It's not much of an odd, an odd absurdum because some people do defend the virtues of, of self-sufficiency. Uh, they, not, they defend it, I think, not understanding what they are defending. Well, they have in mind something quite short of true self-sufficiency, right? I'm not sure what they have in mind, I, 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 and I don't know this for a fact. My impression when I read a lot of these people, Bill McKibben, for example, is is, is one of them, uh, or he's at least not so much self-sufficient, but certainly a you know localist kind mm-hmm. of guy. When I read these people, I, I, I sense that, that they have this notion that uh, m- much of what we today enjoy as wealth or would somehow be out there and still be available, but it would just be available from people that you know rather than from strangers. From strangers. Yeah. And in fact, in fact um, much of our wealth today would disappear if we gave up exchanging globally. It, it it would just go away. I think a lot of these people, our wealth is so deep and so vast that many of these people just take it for granted. Yeah, that's a great observation. It creates the illusion, the the, the, the profusion of, of material well-being that we enjoy and the cornucopia of, of opportunity and goods and services creates the illusion that it somehow independently exists available, say, to be distributed, available to be reclaimed, available to be uh, harnessed. And I, let's start with that uh, that family example of 5703 Oak Street. If you say, let's, have, let's not let any of the jobs get outside our family, we'll do everything for ourselves, and that way we'll be as rich 
will be even richer than we are now because nothing will escape, you immediately realize that that life is extremely poor. You and I have talked about Frontier House, the uh, wonderful PBS uh, documentary where they took five families and made them live by 1880s Montana homesteading uh, rules in the the sense of live by that lifestyle. And each family was more or less Mm self-sufficient. I think they gave each family different things to start with. I think one family got a cow. One family got the beginnings of a house. They do a little bit of exchange. I think the families helped each other put up the, the house if they didn't have one. If there was a crisis, I think they helped each other out. But production in those families was pretty much self-sufficient production. Each family hauled water from the river. Each family chopped wood to heat that water to prepare food. Uh, It was a brutal life. Uh, The show stopped in August uh, so that the people didn't have to live through a true Montana winter. But there was a competition involved, and each family had to see how much they could amass in preparation for that winter. And if I remember correctly, every family would have died. Mm -hmm. Uh, No family amassed enough to uh, survive the winter. Now, one reason for that is that these were people not well suited, particularly to 1880s life. The real people of the 1880s, they didn't all die uh, Mm -hmm. because they chose to go to Montana because they had a particular set of skills, presumably. But none of the people who went to Montana in the 1880s who stayed self-sufficient became wealthy. None of them had an easy life. They may not have died, but... Our ability to accumulate uh, goods and services beyond our own household, if we're only dependent on our own household, is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And if you remember, it's been a while since I've seen that program, but I recall uh, in one of the episodes at least, um, the idealized uh, brotherly love of the community came crashing down. There were these disputes over... I can't remember what the disputes were over, over the placement of a fence or something, but the, these people who knew each other very intimately got really sick and tired of each other and were were grousing at each other. Yeah, they, yeah they're a little tired of, of maybe not buying local, but at least talking local. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened in the show. The show, by the way, I, I recommend it as a wonderful example just to see how different life was in 1880 compared to today, a, a life that we romanticize Um now, I like to say the show was called should have been called Be Careful What You Wish For. You know, 5,000 families wanted to be chosen to be one of the five families who went through this experience. And the five who, who were chosen found it a, quite a bit more difficult and less romantic, I think, than they had, they had expected. Mm-hmm. But toward the end of the show, one of the families uh, built a still and was making uh, illegal alcohol, uh, liquor, and swapping it at the makeshift general store it wasn't a real general store, but a, you know, created for the show. And the other family said he, that he was cheating uh, because he was getting, of course, wealthier. He was accumulating. There was this competitive aspect mm-hmm. of the show that was a little bit silly, but it made the show a little more interesting. Uh, he was cheating. He was he was trading, and he was able to therefore expand the opportunities available to his household by making something that someone else wanted. Uh, but clearly. Uh, self-sufficiency is the road to poverty. It, could, it can never be the road to wealth. And one of the reasons for that is, is you forego specialization, uh, something we talked about in a, in a recent podcast with uh, Michael Munger and the power of the division of labor. So that's clearly part of what we lose when we trade locally. Mm-hmm. I, I, as you know, Russ, I am a, a big fan of the works of the late Julian Simon and his greatest idea is the idea that the ultimate resource is human creativity, human effort, especially human creativity. And the language that we have to discuss the world, in, in a way, masks the reality that I think Julian revealed. In that language, we talk about natural resources as if they're out there. And it's, you know, there is petroleum out there. There is, uh, there is land out there. There are trees out there. There is magnesium in the ground out there. But none of these things are resources until human creativity figures out how to use them productively and figures out not only how to use them productively, how to use them economically. Um, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that uh, uh, Native Americans wandering the Pennsylvania forests 500 years ago uh, when they went to get a drink of water out of a 
uh, a local brook or, or creek, we're, we're pretty annoyed by this bubbling, this stuff bubbling up from the creek that, that made the oil, that made the water taste nasty and, 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 and indigestible. It was oil. It wasn't a resource crude. for them. It was a curse. It was like, it was like dried leaves to us. Uh, human ingenuity said, hey, I know how we can use this stuff to make human life better. And so oil is not even a natural resource. It becomes a resource when human creativity is applied to it. So you take that logic, and it, it, what it tells me is that the greater the number of human beings who are applying their wits, applying their ingenuity, their effort to solving various problems that, that each perceives, the result will be a larger uh, creation of, of wealth, of genuine prosperity. To say buy local is to say, look, let's, let's reduce the number of human beings who are participating in this economy. Uh, and that's to say, let's reduce the number of resources that we have in this economy. Not, not, not just the number of, of, of inanimate resources uh, or non-human resources, but more importantly, the number of units of the ultimate resource, and that's human creativity. And I think it's just, that, that's uh, a, a, a model for, uh, well, depending on how local it is, either catastrophe or, or ex extreme poverty. And let's keep in mind also, that anyone who wants to really live local and live a subsistence life, they can do it. They can just go off to Montana, go off to somewhere in Canada. It's not difficult to get a, get, get a, uh, a few acres of land and live off the land, live really locally. You'll be really poor. Uh, you won't be subject, incidentally, to you know the world monetary shocks. You won't have to care about what the, what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is doing today. You won't have to care about what Asian currency markets are doing today. You'll be shielded from all those things. Of course, you'll also be shielded from, from uh, wealth and prosperity. Well, yeah, that's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great example because I think when we talk about that level of um, simplicity, as it's often uh, romanticized, uh, we don't really mean simplicity true simplicity. We don't really mean true self-sufficiency. People who do go off into the woods, uh, buy those couple acres of land, uh, they take modern implements with them. They sometimes take, take modern technology with them. They certainly want to take modern medicine with them. Uh, they don't truly live uh, self-sufficiently. Uh, they take an axe to chop down the trees they, at a minimum, which is a primitive tool, but a tool that would take... Um, that I would be unable to make out in the woods, and almost every um, one of us would have trouble forging an axe if we truly went and lived in a, a self-sufficient lifestyle. So when we talk about self-sufficiency, we, we really have some sort of uh, imperfect self-sufficiency in mind. But let, let's go back to this, the buying local idea in a, in, a, uh, in a more, what defenders would call a more reasonable context. They would say, well, we don't mean that. We just mean that, that when you say go out to buy um, broccoli, Broccoli. buy it from the local farmer. When you go buy that axe, buy it from the local independent hardware store. Don't get it from Lowe's or Home Depot. When you buy a book, buy it from the local bookseller, the independent. Don't buy it from the big chain. Yes, you may pay a little bit more. Yes, you may have a smaller selection to choose from. But, says the defender, the money that goes to the seller of the item is more likely to stay locally, whereas those big chains, they just take it away. Any truth to that? It seems really silly to me. Um, it, so let's say, let's think through this. I go to Walmart to buy a hedge trimmer or Home Depot to buy a hedge trimmer, big box retailer. Um, I guess the argument is that when I give my money to that big box retailer headquartered somewhere outside of my locale, that the profits revert to wherever the head headquarters are. Or to the stockholders spread out among the country, whereas right. if you gave it to the local guy. You know, it's, 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 uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure how, these, how those things are measured. How do we know what the local guy does? Suppose, suppose the local bookseller then takes the money he earns and goes buy a, a, a Toyota. 
Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> uh, or, uh, suppose he buys a, uh, a refrigerator made in, in uh, China. Uh, when I shop at Walmart, some of the money stays there. They're, they're, they're building buildings in my, my town. They're hiring workers in my town. They're buying uh, uh, some supplies in my town. Um, I just have my, I, I, maybe the, I'm sure this reflects a, uh, a bias in, in me. I, I have a difficult time getting my hand around my, my mind around the notion of you know money staying in some place. Who, who cares where the money stays? What, what, you, what you want are resources. You know what? Money itself is just a medium of exchange. And so what this argument boils down to, as we think through it, is that well, if you buy local, then you just have you just have exchanges among local people. Uh, rather than have exchanges among a, a broad uh, swath of people, and then I get back, we can get back to the point you made earlier. Well, if you're just exchanging among a small number of people, you're poorer than if you're exchanging among a larger number of people. And one other thing, uh, we could, another take, another pers- excuse me perspective on this. Uh, if I buy from my local bookseller rather than buy from Barnes and Noble, let's say I pay 10 percent more because. I'm buying from the local bookseller. Well, uh, what happens to well, how would I have spent the that ten percent had I bought the book instead from Barnes and Noble? Maybe I maybe I would have uh, con, you know contributed it to a local charity, uh, bought more from the local farmers market, hired would, a local handyman to do something on. It's fix up very your house. difficult. I mean, I I see these. I know there are figures where people say, well, you know. Uh, local retailers keep 30%. I don't know what the actual numbers are. Keep X percent of the of the profits in the locale, whereas uh, big box retailers or national chain retailers keep only you know 10. Whatever the numbers are, I, I can't imagine how they really come up with those calculations. Well, yeah, the, those those calculations are inherently um, uh, just fraudulent. Flawed. Um, but but you raise I think what is the the crux of the matter, and I want to try to let's try to dig into it a little bit. And then I want to come back to um, uh, an informational challenge that this philosophy uh, has. Here's what I think is the crux of the matter. Money, as Adam Smith pointed out a long time ago, is not our true source of wealth. It's our command over resources. Money is related to that, obviously, but we worry somehow that if the gold or the dollar bills go outside our house, we've lost something. And the, the the fallacy is to forget you get something in return, mm-hmm. and how you make your decisions determines how much your total command over goods and services is. So when we say, oh, don't buy the hedge trimmer at Home Depot, buy it at the local person, disentangling the true resource impact of that decision is quite difficult, and the money part kind of grabs your attention. So let's strip the money part out, and I think we can see where the economics is really going. So let's let's do the following. Uh, You make the point that you don't really know where the seller is going to – who's just sold you this goods is going to spend the money. Maybe it's local. Maybe it's not. I I wouldn't care. I think – but not only do you not care, I think you're right not (laughs) to care. I think it's a – a fallacy to argue that it matters, and let's try to get out – let's try to get at why. Let's suppose all the citizens of our town – and we're in Fairfax right now. Let's suppose all the citizens of Fairfax, Virginia get together and agree that not only are are they going to try and buy local, they will take any money they get from selling to locals and recycle it, which has a wonderful ring to it, right? Uh, The recycling sounds good. We're not going to let the money escape. Okay, we're going to keep it all here in the local town. Uh, the implication, I think, for the defenders of the idea is that that way the money won't get away and we'll have more. But in fact, we'll be, as we've tried to point out intuitively in the earlier part of the conversation, in fact, we'll be quite a bit poorer. The, the, the saving of the physical green pieces of paper is going to be uh, a red herring because what's fundamentally going to happen is that you and I and our a few thousand other neighbors, maybe another 25,000 or so, 50,000 neighbors, are going to have to make everything for ourselves. So we're going to have to have a Fairfax car manufacturer. 
we're not just going to have to have a Fairfax hedge trimming retailer. We're going to have to have a Fairfax hedge trimming manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So we need someone to make the hedge trimmer because the seller of the hedge trimmer is going to have to get it locally because that we're going to really take advantage of this idea is the argument. We automatically when we when we think of it that way, when we realize we're going to have to not just provide our own economics lectures, which are going to be phenomenal. That part of the economy thinks can be very healthy. We're good at that. Yeah, that. that's one of our strong suits. But there are many many things we're not so strong at. Making hedge tripper, trimmers would be one of them. Hedge clippers. Uh, making automobiles would be another. Uh, doctors. There'll be certain wonderful doctors here in Fairfax. There are others we'd have to train some people to to learn how to do that. And as a result, so when I go to my neighbor and I say, you know. Um, you know, I'd love to buy your car, but it's a hundred thousand dollars. And he says, "Oh, but don't worry. I know it's expensive, but all the money is going to stay here in the community, so it eventually will get back to you." True, it's eighty thousand dollars more than the the dealer over in in Arlington who's importing from outside Virginia. Mm-hmm. But don't worry, all the money is going to stay here. And what's missing from that equation? is the real resources, the true cost of producing the $100,000 car. True, the money will stay in the community, but we will lose all the resources, the time, and the stuff it took to produce that car in this inefficient way with this person who's not as good as either Detroit or uh, – or, or to- I was going to say to- Tokyo, but of course it's, it's often uh, – those Jap- so-called Japanese cars are often produced here in the United States. But the point is that the – the, the money is a veil. It's masking what's really going on. What's really going on is I'm requiring by buy, by being pledging to buy from my neighbor, I'm basically saying I'm going to produce this thing in an incredibly costly. We are going to produce this thing as this extended fifty thousand person Fairfax family. We're going to produce this in this ex, this incredibly costly way. We're going to have less stuff. We're not going to live as well. We're going to have dramatically a dramatically lower standard of living. Now, when I pick one item, the bookstore, the hardware store, I don't see that effect. That effect is still there. And by the way, we, of course, there's nothing wrong with buying locally if that's what you find attractive, if if you think uh, it's a better product or a better value. What we're talking about here is the virtue of buying local in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And our what we're, what we're trying to... Uh, explain here is why there's no inherent virtue to that. Yeah, exactly. I have a, a, a couple of thoughts. One, a lot of the a lot of the folks who are uh, advocates, enthusiasts for buy local, they think of themselves as progressives. Mm-hmm. Um, they're you know they're they're more understanding than than us, the rest of us. Now, not so motivated by business and profits, yeah, perhaps. It seems to me to be highly, in fact, highly unprogressive to uh, be so concerned about the local community, to be so hostile to people who just happen to live outside of some political border. Artificial political border. Yeah. I mean, I, I realize that a lot of this by local stuff is, is, is uh, stems from a, a confusion of buying from distant strangers versus buying from big corporations. Some of the people, I think, mix those two uh, issues up. But to say buy local, which is the term that a lot of people use, uh, to me it sounds like a reversion to uh, you know, these, these antediluvian notions that you know, our little group, our little face-to-face community, that's the relevant. We, th- these are the people who matter, and those strangers out there, sure, those barbarians, yeah. uh, we, we shouldn't care. In fact, we, we should actively seek to distance ourselves from them and have as little as possible contact with them so that we as a community can flourish and be one as a community. That's, that's all Rousseauian romantic nonsense, as, as far as I can tell. Um, another... Um, thought that occurs to me along these lines, and it's, it's, it's a little bit different, but, you know, I, I, I always, as you know, Bastiat is a great hero. Frederick Bastiat is a great hero of mine. And, you know, he, one of his most famous essays is the the petition of the candle makers. Mm-hmm. In that essay, he it was this uh, uh, satire in which French candle makers petitioned the French assembly to force French citizens to uh, paint their windows black and put 
put coverings around all the cracks in their houses so that the sunlight didn't get in during the day because, well, what that, would, that would you know stimulate the French candle-making industry. It would be good for candle makers. It would be terrible. And the sun is a, a terrible curse for candle makers. The, the, I mean, what is more distant than the sun? The sun is far <laughs> more distant than Tokyo or China. And the sun continues to... I mean, it's an incredibly valuable, useful commodity. Sunlight provides heat, provides light, grows crops. Uh... Uh, and it, and, and it, every day, it gives it to us for free, for a- absolutely free. That's so destructive, right? Well, said Bastiat's said candle the, makers. Th- said the candle makers. And so, uh, the, it, the, the 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 serious point here is that when Walmart or uh, Home Depot or Barnes and Noble, you name the whether it be small or large, distant corporation, when they succeed at bringing goods and services into uh, you know, our local neighborhoods that are priced uh, competitively, you know, priced really well, that make them attractive to, to buyers, uh, what, what they do, mainly through, because of competition, they, they want to make a buck, obviously, they want to make money, they want to make a profit. What they do is really supply us value in a way that's kind of free of charge. We, 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 we pay for it. Uh, but the competitive pressures force them, these businesses, to be ever more efficient at what they do. And in a lot of cases, this efficiency takes the form of large economies of scale, not in all cases, of course, but in a lot of cases I mean, well, it does. In the case of Walmart, they also have tremendous technological uh, use of database management and, and, and other things. That's right. And these these are valuable um, – uh, I'm not sure what word to, to use. The, these are valuable outputs. These, these are valuable aspects of the things we buy that are brought to us by these distant – I'm, I'm using scare quotes in my fingers here. These distant corporations, um, and, and and we get them as consumers virtually free of charge. We pay a tiny price for them uh, because we, we we buy them from these distant places. Why should we reject the value that Walmart or Barnes and Noble uh, or Safeway bring to us? Uh, any more than we should reject the value that the sun brings to us. We, we clearly would make ourselves better off by barring up our windows so that we could buy more candles from the local candle maker. Well, we clearly would, would make ourselves better off uh, by buying broccoli that's grown by someone who lives in our town, simply to buy broccoli from someone who lives in our town. Uh, the the it, it, the well, I mean, again, maybe it's just I'm, I'm an economist and I've I've, I've been long. Uh, you know, in this mindset of 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 trade and the division of labor being good and beneficial for human society, that I I really can't appreciate all the reasons that the buy local crowd have for wanting to buy local, but it just strikes me as foolish. Oh, but again, you're getting at the importance of of cost true cost, what economists call cost, foregone opportunities as opposed to just the monetary money that's changing hands. I, I like the point you made earlier about Julian Simon and natural resources. We want to take the world around us and reshape it into things that are valuable. Mm-hmm. Shirts and broccoli and hedge trimmers and um, cars and all the things, health devices, all the things that we care about. To do that takes real resources, and the only way to expand our control, our command over the physical world and have more stuff rather than less, the only way we can live the lifestyle that we have now, and by that I don't mean rich, I mean extraordinary. That is, we contrast the frontier house, 1880s Montana, self-sufficient lifestyle where women die young in childbirth and you don't live very long to see your grandchildren because you're so poor, you don't have the nutrition that you need to have a, the lifespan and things that we're used to. So we're not just talking here about toys and the profusion of material things. We're talking about the whole span of human existence that modern life allows above what uh, a subsistence lifestyle does. To create that, 
you've got to find ways to produce the things that are of value at low cost. That's the name of the game. That's We call it in economics. We call it productivity. It's the only thing there is. And to expand your command over goods and services, that is to grow beyond a subsistence, nasty, brutish, and short life, you've got to find techniques for getting more from than you used to out of the, the resources you have. There are two ways to do that. One is to apply technology to it. The other is to trade, mm-hmm. to find people who can do it more cheaply than you can for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, the example you give of, of, of the candle makers, of, of the, say, better yet, the, the example of Safeway and providing food at a lower cost than the local, the local farmer, if that's true, if Safeway can produce things at a lower cost than the local farmer, to buy from the local farmer is to impoverish, impoverish yourself a little bit. Mm-hmm. The wider you do that, the more you get impoverished. Mm-hmm. That, that's why, again, there's sort of a seen and unseen to come back to Bastiat. You have this seen and unseen phenomenon. When you only look at one little corner of this buy local idea, you think, well, it sounds, yeah, keep the money in town. When you look at it more widely, what you're really saying is cost doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. True cost, real resource cost. Don't take advantage of efficiencies. Don't take advantage of the sun. Don't take advantage of technology. You know, again, one way to think about this in another, a different way of doing the reductio ad absurdum. Should you buy the um, the uh, the item that is mass produced, or should you buy it from the artisan? Well, sometimes the thing that's produced by the artisan is more beautiful, and it's a lovely thing, and you buy it. You buy a more elegant, it might be imperfect, it might have, you know, it's everyone's unique, and there might be reasons that you'd prefer the artistry of an artisan. But mass-produced items are inexpensive. If we only bought from people who did things by, quote, by hand, say the shoemaker, mm-hmm. we pay a huge premium. It's mm-hmm. good for the shoemaker, if relatively good. But if we continue to do that, we basically are saying, I don't want to have the full command of goods and services that I have now. Most of us do want that. Most of us want that modern lifestyle uh, where we don't uh, die at 40 and we live to see our grandchildren. Um, let's move on to a different let's move on to a different area where this is sometimes uh, applied uh, to international trade. Uh, people will say it's bad to buy you know it's very bad to buy from China because uh, the Chinese don't buy as much from us as we buy from them. And therefore, more money goes out of the United States than comes in. And therefore, the trade deficit we run with China is a form of impoverishment. And again, I think this argument totally misunderstands what's really going on, which is the exchange of of, uh, something we want for something that someone else wants. And in the case of China... Uh, they don't just want goods from us; they want other things, right? Right. I mean, you you, you know that I'm I have a, a an almost uh, uh, wild obsession with the trade deficit. <laughs> it's one of my pet peeves. One, one we share, I partly from uh, hanging out together. I think in the same department. Uh, yeah, and it, and there are a lot of aspects. There are a lot of aspects to it. I I I, I as you know, I even believe that you know the 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 trade deficit with the whole world is a, an almost meaningless concept and certainly is nothing we should worry about. But that aside, talking about a trade deficit with an individual country is absolutely ludicrous. And you know the standard argument that economists for a long time have made, but it, it applies. Um, I do not uh, work at uh, a supermarket. I generally shop at Giant Supermarkets, a local chain here in the D.C. area. So for the past, and I've lived in this area on and off for the past 22 years, so I have this long-running and ever-increasing trade deficit with the Giant Supermarket. I go in several times a week, uh, at least once a week. I buy things from them. They buy nothing from me. You mean the the, 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 the executives of Giant don't come enroll at George Mason to take your classes and help finance your salary? Well, I, they, a couple they of them might, but not yeah, certainly right. not in the magnitude of you're buying their groceries. However you measure it, I'm sure I have a huge trade deficit with Giant. Now, it would be ludicrous for me to say, you know, I have a trade deficit with Giant. I should stop trading with them until they start buying as much from me, which I assume mean they they would hire me. Um, and the, the the fact is, uh, each of us has a huge trade deficit with almost almost everyone with whom we deal economically. Uh, and a huge trade surplus with one or two people, our, our, our employers. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the way of the world. Uh, there, it would be freakish in the extreme 
if the United States had quote unquote balanced trade with every individual country that that we deal with why why would why would we expect that China, which is has a population much different than the United States, uh, both in terms of size, taste, and uh, skills. income skills. Why would we expect that the Chinese, year after year or period after period, would purchase from us the same val- no, value of goods and services that we purchase from them? It could, it could happen. There would be nothing bad Random about it. There would be nothing particularly good about it either. It would be freakish if it did happen, actually. And, you know, and a similar example, I'm sure that Virginia runs a trade deficit with many states in the United States and a surplus with some. And I'm sure there's the nothing case. good or bad about it being balanced that somehow we should uh, make sure that with each state we have a we import and export exactly the same amount. I'm delighted we don't take uh, uh, that these things aren't generally measured. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, you know, <laughs> Virginians and Delawareans and Californians would get all upset about their trade deficits and trade surpluses. But it's a nice so, example because uh, if you were Foolish, and you saw a trade deficit, say between Virginia and let's say uh, Michigan, because mm-hmm. you a lot of Virginians buy, say, American-made cars in Detroit. Uh, you might conclude, incorrectly, of course, you might conclude that somehow there's something unfair going on. There must be something going on in Michigan that's keeping people in Michigan from buying Virginian products. Right. Uh, but of course, we know that there is no barrier in this case, and similarly. The fact that we pers- run persistent trade deficits, say, with uh, Japan or China, although there are some barriers between the two countries, if there were zero barriers, we would still run trade deficits with for, with many, many countries. Ab- absolutely, and trade surpluses with, with others. others. Yeah. But but let, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into the trade deficit issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the term itself is an artifact of human definition. It, it, it means... Certain things. I mean, basically, it means there are some other complexities, but, but basically, it means you, you run a trade deficit if, during some period, let's say a month or a year, whatever period you choose, the um, the uh, the dollar value of goods and services that you import is greater. You as a country is greater than the dollar value of goods and services that you export. Well, we have to ask what are the foreigners doing with this excess money? Why would the Chinese, to use them as the example, why would they sell us, I'm just making up a figure here for for discussion purposes, why would they sell us a billion dollars worth of their goods and services that they they sweated and toiled to produce and buy from us only $600 million worth of our goods and services? What what, what are they giving us, 400 million? They're suckers. Yeah, well... Uh, or or we're suckers, as some people would say. Yeah. Um, now, you know, it, it, it's all fine and fine and good to say, boy, it would be great if they were giving us that four hundred million. I, I wish, I, I, for my own selfish reasons, I wish they were. I, I every day I wake up and That'd I wish that awesome. Toyota would would, would would knock on my door and offer me a free Lexus. Yeah. They, they've never done it. No, it's, it's such a disappointment. Yeah, uh, but if, if if they would, I wouldn't feel distraught. And I doubt I could find anyone in America who would feel distraught. At least anyone who doesn't work for the UAW. Actually, even people who work for the UAW would probably secretly like such a, such a deal. Um, so, what are the Chinese doing with this four hundred? Why do they why do they want this four hundred million dollars that, that they that they don't use that they don't to use come to buy, buy our, our goods and services? Well, let's see what what, what they do with it. Uh, if they uh, invest it in the United States, and they do much of it. Much yeah. of it is invested. Uh, then. The money, in fact, does come back, if you want to think in those terms. It just comes back as demand for dollar-denominated assets rather than dollar-denominated goods and services. It, it, they, they may build, a, they may, it may be lent to a, a, a U.S. firm to expand a factory in Ohio or California. Uh, it may be loaned to Uncle Sam. It may come back as foreign direct investment by the Chinese. The Chinese themselves may, may uh, you know, Build a retail outlet in in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, it may come back as investment demand for real estate, as investment demand for corporate stocks, corporate bonds. They may hold on to it just as as dollars. Cash, well, yeah. let's take an extreme. Let, let, let's suppose the Chinese take the take the four hundred, literally the four hundred million dollars, and then uh, believing in the mercantilist fallacies that so many people around the world believe in. 
uh, they they torch the four hundred million. They burn it as a punishment of Ameri- the American economy. Right. Fantastic right. strategy. It's sinister, isn't which, it? So frightening. Which, which would be the extreme case? The, the, of the, the money worst not case coming back. Scenario, yeah. Because it, it can't. Learn. But even then, even then, in a very real way, that money comes back. At least the purchasing power comes back. Because if they torch that money, then the goods and services that, that they otherwise could have bought with that money now they can't. Which means that those goods and services are now available for you and me to buy. In monetary terms, what that means is that the value of the money that you and I have in our wallets and our checking accounts, the value of all outstanding dollars remaining in circulation, rises a little bit. And so we get our purchasing power rises. Um, But, of course, the Chinese don't do that. They're not dumb. But I want to stick with that example because I think, again, it really focuses us on the real resources that are involved in trade and shows us the fallacy of focusing on the dollars and the green pieces of paper. When the Chinese uh, sell us toys and clothes and and the the things that we import from them and they take dollars in return, those dollars are claims on American goods and services or, as you point out, American assets. If they choose not to use those claims – if they choose to torch them, bury them, use them as wallpaper in their house or whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever thing they do where the money, quote, doesn't come back, it's clear if you step aside and step back from the veil of money what's gone on, and it's the gift. That's it's right. back to the sunlight. It's basically saying uh, – it's I call it the Santa Claus, uh, the North Pole story. You know, The Chinese sell us toys – an incredibly low price, cheaper than than it was 10 years ago, much cheaper than it was, say, 25 years ago when, we, when America made its own toys domestically. So basically it said something close to, here's free toys. Uh, you know, Santa Claus coming down the chimney and you find a bunch of stuff uh, uh, in your living room. Uh, that, Not just on December 25th, every right, day of all the year. The, all, <laughs> right, it's the year-round, uh, the year-round Santa Claus. Now, only a fool says, ooh, it's a plot. It's a Trojan horse. It's going to destroy our economy. Don't take it. The economist says, this is a bargain mm-hmm. because what we get is toys and clothes and watches and everything else, the shirts and shoes the Chinese make that we import from them. And for some peculiar reason, they're working for us for nothing if they burn the money. Yeah. What they've done is they've given us a gift, ask for nothing in return. That would be the best of all possible worlds. Because what that would allow us to do is take all the resources we would have had to devote to either making them ourselves or creating something to swap for those things, and instead we get them for nothing? Right. Good for us. That, right. what, that is what makes you rich. Now, unfortunately, as you point out, they do want the money. They, do, they want it either for a mix – they want it for a mix of goods. They want it for a store of value, which is wonderful when it's that way. They want it to take a claim on future American productivity when they invest it. It's why they made the goods in the first place. It's a good exchange for both sides. But as they lower the cost of us buying their stuff through competition and innovation and and other means, we get more wealthy than we were before. To refuse it on the grounds that it's somehow hampering our domestic productivity is to misunderstand what trade really does. Exactly. And there's another aspect to this. It's it's related, of course. But um, when the the Chinese or any foreigner – uh, uh, sells us things and then does not Im- turn around and spend all of the proceeds buying goods and services, but instead invests it in dollar-denominated assets, that's another way of saying, they're, they, well, they're saving. Yeah, they've right? expanded our now, saving, now, our, our pool of capital. Now, we celebrate <laughs> properly when fellow Americans save more, and we're upset when when the American saving rate falls. Savings is good because savings... Uh, uh, allows resources to be transferred from the, the satisfaction of current consumption desires to the creation of of capital goods and research and development. Future productivity. That, that's right, that increased productivity that increases the flow of goods and services for consumption in the future. Why? If I'm, if I'm to be happy that someone in Minnesota saves more or someone in Hawaii saves more or someone... Uh, just across town here in Fairfax says more. Why should I be upset if someone in Canada or someone in Mexico or someone in China saves more and invested in the economy? I don't see the difference. If someone is saving more, that's great. Now, 
personally, I wish I personally saved more, but that's my own decision. If re- Regardless of how much or how little I save, the economy of which I am a part is improved when other people do save more and it's invested according to market-directed signals. And that's true whether these other people are fellow Fairfaxians or Chinese or Taiwanese. It makes no difference. Yeah, and we should point out that the the U.S. tax code, most economists believe, biases our individual choices toward consumption and away from savings artificially. It's not just a right. problem of self-control that we have or myop- myopia. Well, mine self-control. Oh, in your case, yeah. Well, of course. Um, mine is myopia. <clears throat> um, but it's – so when we talk about the savings rate of United States citizens, I wish it were higher, not because somehow savings in and of itself is good, which right. although it has benefits – the actual level of saving is artificially lowered by our tax system, and it would be uh, the world would be a better place. I think if we had a, a more uh, a different uh, tax system that was more that did right. not discriminate against savings. That, 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 that is a point worth making. That 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 like anything else, savings in and of itself is neither good nor nor bad. More saving is not necessarily good. You just you want it to reflect the. Preferences. The preferences and the real constraints that exist out in the world, and you don't want it to be distorted by by uh, uh, government policy. Uh, now, I, ha- having said that, I, I, I'm prepared to believe that foreign governments and our government, uh, obviously our government, uh, pursue policies that distort the savings and investment rate. But if, as an, speaking as an American, if the Chinese the Japanese, the Czechs, whoever, uh, for whatever reason, pursue policies that result in uh, those persons uh, earning monies by selling things to us that we voluntarily purchase, and then saving and investing some portion of their earned proceeds back into the American economy, uh, that benefits me unambiguously. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and moreover, not only, it, not only does it make the economy better off, right? It is also a signal. Uh, I mean, to, to, to the extent that it does reflect, and a lot, in a large degree, it does. To the extent that it really that it reflects, uh, um, you know, people's foreigners' genuine opinions about about various economies. It's a signal that the American economy is promising. Why should I ask my students? I said, Look, if if Bill Gates came up to you and said, you know, I think you're a really promising young young man or young woman. I'd like to invest in you. Um, now, how would I ask this? How would you feel? Uh, and of course, you should feel great. Now, for various reasons, you might say, no, I prefer that you don't. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to have an, uh, an obligation to repay you in the future. But you surely wouldn't go home at night and think, oh, gee, something must be wrong with me. Some, yeah. some very savvy business person wants to invest in me. What, what, where have I gone wrong? You, you would, you'd, be, you'd be happy. You'd be pleased. And I, I just want to add, when you, when you say it's good for the economy, of course, you, you mean that it's good for people, yes. people, that expanding our capital stock, increasing the productivity and capital available to workers is going to raise our productivity and our standard of living. Um, it's not just that, so, quote, GDP rate will be higher. Or no, no, no. The our, growth rate will be higher. Our, 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 ability, our command over goods and services that we regard as – as useful devices for helping us to expand our quality of life it, it, it increases. I, I want to take a, a related example. It's the same point, but I, you hear it so often, and I, I hear it from people, I think, who, who really understand economics, except in this one area where they, they seem to have a blind spot, and that's uh, immigrants. <clears throat> people come to our economy from all over the world, and there's an extraordinary phenomenon, which I've never seen in person, but I've, I've read about it and heard about it and talked to people who've participated in it, which is you go down to Western Union uh, on the weekends or during the week, and you'll find people who have come here from around the world sending part of what they've earned here as workers back to friends and families in Mexico and Guatemala and Costa Rica and Peru, uh, in Vietnam, etc., uh, they're wiring money back home. Uh, there are different ways that they can do that. Of course, they can literally take it back home on a visit, etc. And I view this as a glorious thing. Here's a way that the horrible poverty around the world is being ameliorated, being improved, and 
the, the effects of it being reduced by people coming, resources flowing, speaking like an economist for a sec, resources flowing to their highest valued use. Here we have people who find it more economically valuable, financially valuable to work in our country rather than their home country to such a degree that they're willing to come to a place where the culture is alien, where the language is alien often, and prosper in it leave enough. Their, leave their family. Leave their family yeah. behind, prosper enough to be able to help them do better than they otherwise would. And I think that's a glorious thing, and it's a form of, quote, foreign aid mm-hmm. that is private and voluntary and that reduces world poverty. It's a beautiful thing. But I've heard smart people say to me, well, that's the horrible part of immigration. Immigration's fine, you know, more or less, but the the horrible thing about it is they, they the money leaves the United States. And again, it's, it's it's the same fallacy that we've been talking about, which is focusing on the money rather than the exchange of real values. So basically, someone comes to uh, cut my lawn from Guatemala. I give them money in return for cutting my lawn. You save time. You don't have to do I it. save you can, time. You can pod, do a podcast with me. I can do a podcast that would be in home cutting my lawn. Actually, I could do probably two podcasts because it would right. take me two hours. The Guatemala does it in about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he does it, by the way, with – with, with capital that I don't have access to. I would do it with a, a simple lawnmower, either a gasoline-powered or a, or a push lawnmower. I have a small lawn. He, he does it with a remarkable device that he stands on, mm-hmm. and it goes about 40 miles an hour. It's a frightening uh, um, a display of skill and bravado that he can stand on the back of this thing and, and go at such high speeds. But it's a specialized piece of capital that mm-hmm. isn't worth it for me to have. It's a, another beautiful example of the extent of the market. He cuts enough lawns that it's worthwhile for him to have that device. It wouldn't be worth it for me to own it on my own. And I essentially rent it from him by hiring him for the 15 minutes it takes him to cut my lawn. And you pay him and he ships the money? I pay him. He ships some of the money. I get a cut lawn. He gets a a wonderful mix of goods and services for himself and goods and services for his loved ones uh, back in Guatemala to somehow suggest that it would be better that he didn't send the money back, that he spent it here First of all, ignores the fact that if he spent it here, we would, of course, have to use goods and services to provide those to him, and it really doesn't make any difference. But if he sends it home, of course, those dollars do come back. Yeah, the I wish they interest, didn't. But why, 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 why would why, why would someone in Mexico accept the dollars? Well, of course, you know, someone living in the interior of Mexico is not going to spend dollars actually in the interior of Mexico. But the reason when when they get that money, they they uh, exchange those uh, dollars for pesos, and you have to ask, well, why would a Mexican bank or money exchanger accept you know, you know, sacrifice valuable pesos that could be spent in Mexico in exchange for green pieces of paper with pictures of dead American statesmen on them. Well, it's because that bank knows that those monies can be spent in the United States. Of course the money come, comes back. It's, it, it's foolish for people to think that they don't. Um, I, I, I know we're getting near the end. I want to read. I want to, you know I have a quotation here I want to yeah, read. Yeah, I, I wonder, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, and it, it, this quotation is from uh, the historian uh, Will Durant, uh, from uh, his 1939 volume called The Life of Greece. And in this part, he's talking about uh, Minoan and how Minoan culture expanded and and became rich. He says the same thing later about uh, Periclean Athens, about how in the course of 100 years, Athens went from being a local economy to a citywide economy to an international economy. And he, he states very clearly, it was that explosion of wealth that made uh, Athens what we celebrate today, ancient Athens, what we celebrate today. Um, and, and so this is, this applies not only to these bi-local arguments, but but to you know bi-national arguments as well. And here's a quotation from Will Durant: "The crossroads of trade are the meeting place of ideas, the attrition ground of rival customs and beliefs. Diversities beget conflict, comparison, thought." Superstitions cancel one another, and reason begins. Very end quote. That's a very powerful statement. Trade not only brings us goods and services, and you know innovation because of competition from outside suppliers. It in what Durant is saying here is that it it, it and I think he's kind of, I think it's true. Trade in a very real way is a source of human reason. It is the it it certainly is a source of human cosmopolitan attitudes. It destroys the distinction between good us and bad them. 
And uh, at this, least it should. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I love that quotation. I have it hanging on my office door. My guest today has been Don Boudreau, Chairman of the Economics Department at George Mason University, my co-host at CafeHayek.com, the blog that we write together. Don, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, as always. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <music>